think it will be a, uh, a worthwhile discussion if you can be here live. Okay. Anything else before we get started? All right, let's um, review a bit what we did in our last class. Um, in our last class, we talked about obscenity. And we did a case, uh, Miller, which tried to put together a test for obscenity. Yes, Ashley. Oh, I was going to ask you to do closed captioning. You were wrong yet, but you did it. I, I was way ahead of you. Yeah, no, it just, I, it's not automatic. I have to like click a few things and it just took me a second to click them, but I clicked them. Okay. Um, do the captions help? I, I hope they do. I think they do at least. I, I think they're useful. Um, so we have this Miller test. Um, uh, where am I on the, on the roster? Who am I up to? That's me. Am I right at W? I'm all the way at the bottom? Oh, man. All right, Megan. Uh, can you just refresh your memory? What were the three... What were the three... Uh, by the way, a couple of you messaged me about keeping your camera off. That, that's fine. I, a lot of people have things going on today. That, that's not a problem. Megan, what's the, what are the three factors from the uh, Miller test, if we can re refresh from last week? So... Um... The first one was whether the average person would find the work as a whole appear, appeals to a prurient interest. The second was whether... What, what, what does prurient mean? Um, I think it was like patently offensive. No, no. Rachel, uh, Rachel Duffy, what's prurient mean? Um, does it... Current mean it's appealing to a sexual interest or would arouse sexual interest or desires. Yeah, exactly right. That's good. Right. So the first element of the obscenity test is sexual nature, right? Um, it can't be that you're, you know, looking at some photographs of, of you know, naked people for non-sexual reasons. So, you know, imagine a, um, you know, biology textbook or, you know, a manual of how to perform an autopsy, right? No, I'm just making something up, right? Um, there are certain depictions of nudity that are not designed to appeal to sexual interest, okay? Rachel, I have you here. What's the second element we have from the Miller test? The second one is if it depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual contact, conduct as defined by an applicable state law. So if under that state's law, it's patently offensive. All right, and help us out again. What does patently offensive mean? Um, what is, doesn't patently offensive mean to like a, a reasonable person? It would be defend their sensibility. Yeah, very mushy, right? It's a jury question, right? Uh, more or less. Um, it's not just offensive; it's patently offensive. I mean, really offensive, whatever whatever that means. All right. Now, uh, Chase, are you here? Chase? Yes. Okay. Almost at the bottom of the alphabet. <laughs> Chase, um, help us out here. What's the third element for the Miller test? The third element is whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. All right. I actually, I want to focus on this third one because I think it's the uh, most relevant factor for the Stevens case, the case we have to say, which I'm sure a lot of you hate me for assigning. I, so it's a funny thing. You know, I, I can assign cases on slavery, abortion, eugenics, like, ah, la -di -da -di -da. but animal cruelty, people just lose it. Like, they, they just, this case just, <laughs> it happens every year. Chase, what does it mean for something to have, or something, for something to lack, serious, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? What does, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. And like arouse you sexually, and there's not really anything. There's not any sort of purpose towards it. Well, let's say there's a let's say there's a book that does appeal to the prurient interest. Let's say it's a book, you know, a romance novel, right? Which does have some scenes that might appeal to uh, sexual uh, emotions. Let's say there's a movie, um, and there's a sex scene in the movie. I mean, yeah, lots of movies too. We we watch TV, right? 
why why does a movie with a sex scene that has some sort of literary artistic value fall outside the bounds of obscenity? Because I guess we don't want to just cancel the movie just for having a sex scene that has some sort of value. Cancel, guy. Yeah. Welcome to 2021. We would say censor in the past, but yes, I suppose cancel uh, is, is the right word as well. Um, so we want to protect. Now, Chase, one more question, then you're, then you're done. What does it mean to lack serious artistic value? What does the word serious mean there? This this comes up a lot in the Stevens case. Well, in the, the Stevens case, it, it kind of means that it's not something that like I, I guess like this is like the thing about the Voltaire quote, and it's not like there's not like a serious value to it. What if, you know, is there, is there such a thing as a, I'm sorry, Chase, I didn't interrupt you. Um, <clears throat> is there such a thing as a slight artistic value? Is that okay? What if something is like, you know. I would say so, yes. So if something has a little artistic value, would that be obscene? What does, what's, what's, what does it mean to lack a serious value? What does that actually mean? Like you're just throwing in, if you're just throwing in something to like in the obscene, but so it like has a little bit of value, but it's not like a serious. Oh, I don't know if that's right. All right, try Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon, are you here, Sheldon? I am. Okay, Sheldon, I'll ask you the same question. What does that mean? Lack significant. Um, uh, I'm sorry, lack serious literary, artistic, political, social value. The, uh, are you asking how they describe it in Stevens? No, 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 I'm just asking Miller. Maybe we'll get to Stevens a little bit later, but, well, I'll ask you both ways. Oh. First, give it to me in Miller, and second, give it to me in Stevens, since you, you seem to want to answer both. I can't quite remember how they described it in Miller. They didn't. Um, they didn't. Wasn't much there. Oh, okay. Then, yeah, then, then, then maybe, um, then maybe how's it done in Stevens? In Stevens, they they said that the only reason the word serious is used there is to ensure that someone can't put a quote of Voltaire in front of something and then say it has educational value. Ah, so uh, let let's say you have a you know some a, a obscene film where you know people are engaging in acts involving excretion and they do it while you know uh, Beethoven's Fifth is playing in the background. <laughs> in, in other words, you take the most like insane that clockwork orange. Okay. Yeah. Whatever example you want to use. Right. But <laughs> yeah, you basically have like, you know, a classical music soundtrack on the most obscene pornography, pornographic film you can think of. Does that suddenly make it having artistic value? Uh, not according to the court in Stevens. No. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. What kind of mic are you using? looks like an impressive mic system you got. Uh, this is a, this is an XLR AT 2020. Oh, wow. It's not, it's not particularly nice. It's a cheaper XLR condenser. Well, I just have a big fuzzy pop filter on it. Well, most students don't have any setups, so I appreciate students who have setups. All right, very good. Thanks, Sheldon. I appreciate that. God, I'm on like half of the semester. I'm going down to the, my W's. I'm seeing my students for the first time. Uh, I appreciate that. So we, again, we have this test, whether the work taken as a whole, right, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary value. And we have this, you know, by the way, uh, John Roberts drives me nuts, but the man can write. I mean, he, he he was, I think, the best lawyer of his day when he was in private practice because he could write so well. And even though Roberts drives me nuts, his writing is so good. And when he's on, he's on better than anyone else. Just at this point, in my view, Roberts and Kagan are the best writers in the court. They go one and two, two and one, you know, but Roberts is like, um, he's an example, right? Uh what if you have some obscene publication and you randomly put a quote from Voltaire, famous philosopher, like in the book, right? So you have a, imagine you have like a, a magazine with like the most obscene photographs in there. And on you know the front inside cover, you put a little bit of Shakespeare or something, right? Is that serious literary value? No, you just put that in there to save it. Now, I don't want to be totally, you know, dismissing this idea because there are some jurisdictions that have limited, um, you know, new dancing right? Strip clubs. 
And strip clubs actually put on performances of Shakespeare where the, where the, where the actors, the, uh, the strippers were, were in the nude performing Shakespeare. Uh, some, I think they did like the Tempest and, you know, Midsummer's Night Dream where it actually kind of works well uh, in the, like a little, like, like a little uh, Greek theme. Um, but the uh, people have tried this before. So Roberts wasn't just speaking out of whole cloth. But this third element, I think, becomes very significant with, with Stevens, right? Now, uh, uh, Brian, you here? Yes. Okay, Brian, let me ask you a question, please. How are courts supposed to be in the business of deciding when some work has literary or artistic or, or scientific value? How is that something courts can decide? Um, well, if I'm understanding your question correctly, it seems like that was one of the main issues. So like it's, it's not – courts shouldn't always have to decide every time there's a question about this like kind of arbitrary – um, standard, right? Uh, that, that seemed like it was one of the big issues. Okay. Brian, let me ask you a follow-up then. Should Congress or a state legislature be in the business of deciding what does and does not have literary scientific value? No, so that just, it's kind of I don't know if antithetical is the right word, but it's like, it just, it goes against, it goes against the first amendment and like what it stands for. You know, that, yeah. if I was reading I, I, in the uh, supplement, I guess it's called, you're welcome. Uh, that, yeah. that, <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's contrary. Like the, the values of the American, I thought this was interesting. The values of the American people are already embodied in the yeah. first amendment. That's actually John and Roberts. That's, that's freedom of, that's not me. That's John Roberts all the way, <laughs> but I quote it from Roberts. So yeah, you give him the, give him all the credit. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So this is a really good case, uh, Stevens. Um, it's eight to one decision. Thank you, Brian. It's an eight to one decision with a very, I think a very thorough dissent by justice Alito um, on the current court. Um, we have a very pro free speech court. Um, it's probably the most pro free speech court we've had since the 1960s, since the Warren court. Um, the court's certainly pretty divided, left and right, conservative, liberal, and you, you know this from taking con law. Um, but on free speech, they're pretty unified. The only outlier consistently is Justice Samuel Alito. He dissents in all these cases, in every single one. He dissents in Stevens. Um, he dissents in Brown. He dissents in Snyder against Phelps, which you read a few weeks ago. Right? He's always in dissent. Um, he has a very traditional view of free speech, and he thinks that the court's perhaps gone too far. And, and I, I really appreciate the eight to one opinion um, because if it's a unanimous opinion, you think, oh, wow, then there's no other side, right? There's only one side to this issue. But when there's a solo dissent, it signals to the world that, well, this is not such an easy issue, that there's a justice in the court who wrote a very thorough opinion, and <clears throat> the majority doesn't always respond well to them. If you remember in Snyder versus Phelps, there was the funeral protest. But they also had this online blog post called The Epic, which targeted uh, Matthew Snyder, the, 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 the slain Marine. Uh, the majority, Justice Roberts said, oh, we won't consider that because it wasn't in the certiorari petition. Yeah, right. And Alito's like, whoa, how can you just omit a piece of evidence in the case? And I think here, Alito suggests that we shouldn't have such a broad opinion. Maybe there's a more narrow opinion that could uphold this prosecution of this disturbed and perverted individual, Mr. Stevens. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. Corey Z, are you here? Corey? Oh, come on. You're the last one in the alphabet. You, you're missing. Oh, God. Uh, uh, fine. A, it is. It was A. Melissa. You here? No, Melissa. Okay. Troy. What's going on? You're not hearing me? All right. Emma? I'm here. Wow, that's three in a row. All right. Well, look, I, I this happens 
on Zoom, if I if I see that people are skipping class because they're next in the alphabet, I will um, start calling them first in the next class. Uh, I don't want to do that, but I will. Um, just just don't do it, and I I will make a I'll make a scene. It's just not worth it. All right, Emma, help us out here. Let's start with the facts in this awful, awful case, U.S. versus Stevens. Uh, what, what happened here? Um, yes. So, the, so I guess Congress uh, came out with some legislation trying to target these crush videos. Um, and the uh, defendant was convicted basically. Let's just, but let's just, so the statute, we'll get to what Mr. Stevens did in a minute, but I want to talk about the statute. Um, did the statute only ban, and by the way, I, I, I'll spare Emma, a crush video. Um, if you don't know what that is, you are a good human being. Um, if you know what a crush film is, you're an awful person. Um, I had never heard of crush films till this case. Oh, God, about a decade ago now, if you're old. If you're old. Um, people, people derive sexual arousal from a lot of different things. One genre, or Al Trebek would say genre, genre, right, of these films was a crush film, where basically you would have women in sort of dominatrix gear in high heel shoes crushing little cute animals with their heels. Um, I've never seen one. I can't fathom. I can't fathom such a video. Um, I like animals, um, but it, it's dreadful. Okay. Okay, you're welcome. I didn't make you define that, Emma. What exactly? Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, some things I do myself, right? What exactly, Emma, did the statute prohibit? Did it only prohibit um, the distribution of crush films? Depictions of animal cruelty. Um, All right, I need to be a little more precise. What What okay. did the what, this the, the the precision is actually important here? So, just what exactly did the statute prohibit? Uh, for knowingly creating, selling, or possessing a depiction of animal cruelty, if done. For okay, let me let me just stop you there, I and mean, I'll I'll go on to someone else in, in a minute. Did it actually prohibit the act of cruelty itself? No, it did not. Ah, so state animal cruelty law still existed for people who abused animals, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, F thank thank you for that, Emma. Um, Anthony, you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, Anthony, help me out, my friend. <clears throat> What exactly did the statute prohibit, right? It, 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 Emma said it prohibits uh, creation, sale, or possession of animal cruelty. How uh, does this statute go ahead and define that phrase, animal cruelty? They define animal cruelty as anything in which a living animal is intentionally maimed, mutilated, tortured, wounded, or killed. And if it violated the federal or state law, the creation, sale, or possession Okay. All right. Thanks. One second. I'll come back to you in a second, Anthony. So it says a living animal is intentionally, so there's a mens rea, maimed, um, mutilated, tortured, wounded, or killed. And and the only word that matters there is, is wounded because all the other ones are just, it's, it's greater. So if you intentionally wound an animal and that conduct violates federal or state law, not just where the creation takes place, but also where it's possessing. So imagine you commit an act that's legal in your home state, but it's illegal in another state, it's a felony. Okay. What if you film some video that's legal in another country, for example, cockfighting um, or bullfighting, legal in Spain and other places? But illegal in the United States. All right. Now, Anthony, what are the exceptions to the statute? Uh, they listed out that it was exempt from prohibition of any depiction that has serious religious, political, scientific, educational, journalistic, historical, or artistic value. Why does this sound familiar, or at least it should sound familiar? Um, because we've talked about it before. Yeah, I know, but we, what, what was the test? What was the case? We did, Only a few minutes ago we did it. Um, the, the Miller? Yeah, exactly. So here Congress was trying to track the third element of the Miller test, right? And just if you forgot already, the third element is whether the work lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Thank, thanks, Anthony. And in fact, they, they went even greater. They, they exempted even more speech. It's not just literary, artistic, political, or scientific. They added 
um, educational, journalistic, or historical. So they added four and three. So there are a total of seven categories that are exempted. Okay. Um, uh, how's Anthony? Uh, Haley, are you here? Hi, how are you? Haley, would a crush film be obscene? In other words, would a crush film satisfy all three elements of the of the of the Miller test? I would argue yes. Okay. Does this statute purport to prohibit obscenity? Um, I'm not sure. I want to say that that's what they were after. Ah, was that the only thing they were after? Well, the legislative intent was for the crush videos, but it was kind of overbroad. Ooh, okay. So Haley, let me ask you this follow-up question. This case about dog fighting, right? Yeah. Now, do you think people watch dog fighting to appeal to sexual arousal, prurient interests? No. Probably not. I mean, I, I mean, maybe some people do, but I'm guessing the answer is not. Um, what if Congress had written a statute that just said, we ban obscenity, right? And they have the three factors from Miller, one, two, three. Could Mr. Stevens have been prosecuted under that statute? No, he couldn't. Uh, so this statute is not only about banning obscenity, is it? No. So they tried to draw in the third factor of the Miller test. They kind of didn't do the one and two. All right. Th thanks so much for the Haley. All right. So this was a video that, you know, they, they get your attention with the crush films, right? It's like there's this oh, awful, you know, this awful thing with these poor animals are torture for sexual gratification. My God, I can't, can't even fathom this. But this statute also allows prosecution for non sexual acts of animal cruelty. For example, dog fighting, um, cock fighting, right, with roosters, um, bullfighting, uh, you, know, you know, in Spain, like, you know, with, with, the, with the red cape. I, I've never seen a bullfight. I've seen videos of it. It's kind of gross. Um, you know, that, that's not my thing. Um, hunting. Uh, Fishing. Um, there are many types of hobbies that involve wounding animals. All right. Okay. So you have a prosecution by Mr. Stevens, and he's all dog fight. I'm sorry, pit bull fighting video, which is illegal in all fifty states. So. He can be prosecuted for um, actual engaging in the pit and the dog fighting, but the feds come in and charge him with this other offense, this this um, the, the, this animal violence, this animal violence act, because he distributed these videos in interstate commerce, as as we would say. So when this case was first argued, the Obama administration made a couple arguments. Um, first, the government argued that the court should recognize a new category of unprotected speech. Acts of animal cruelty should be a category of unprotected speech. Uh, William, you here? Yes, sir. How does the court respond to that argument about recognizing a new category of unprotected speech for animal cruelty. Um, they basically said that because through the legislation they were solely specific, uh, solely focusing on crush videos, but they wrote it so overbroad that no, not yet, not yet, not yet. No, you're you're like five minutes ahead. My questions were narrow. Right. When I say a category of unprotected speech, a grant, give me an example of a category of unprotected speech that, that the courts recognized before. Uh, like defamation, fraud? Yeah, defamation, fraud, obscenity, right? Obscenity. Incitement of violence, Brandenburg, 
right? There's like four or five categories of unprotected speech. Okay. Does Chief Justice Roberts want to add to that list? No, sir, he doesn't. Why not? Because uh, it'll allow the government to take and choose what they were. I think he mentioned like we're, it would be putting too, too much trust into the executive government to only prosecute what they see fit. Not exactly. Um, Ryan, you here? Ryan? Mackenzie? Yes, sir. I'm here. Mackenzie, why does the court not want to add a new category of unprotected speech? Um, because they said that um, depictions of animal cruelty are not, um, there's like no American tradition Good. for excluding such depictions Good. Uh, from First Amendment. Protection. Good. Is there a long standing tradition of banning obscenity? Uh, no, I believe that there. They said there are certain like categories such as obscenity. That uh, yeah, you, you answered my question. Is there a tradition of, of, of banning obscenity as a category of speech? Yes. Yes. Is there a long tradition of banning defamation? Yes. Okay. Is there a long history of tr banning fraud? Yes. Okay. Is there a long history of banning incitement to violence? Yes. Not sure, but, but pro so. probably, probably yeah. a good, good guess. But is there any tradition in the history of the United States of banning the depiction of animal cruelty? No, sir. Okay, good. Thank you, Mackenzie. Okay, so just draw this distinction in your notes. There's a very long tradition of banning animal cruelty itself, right? There's no question about that. But there's no similar tradition of banning the depiction of animal cruelty. And what Robert says is the court should not be in the business of recognizing new categories of unprotected speech. And this is what Grant was getting. He just he was like two minutes ahead of where I wanted to go. Okay. Um, when you create a category of unprotected speech, you're basically removing an entire mode of communication from permissible bounds, right? Right? You're just removing it altogether. So if the court's going to remove speech and let the government have that much authority. Roberts is going to need some history. Now, uh, Jack, you here? Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, Jack, Roberts doesn't always say what he's doing. He drives me nuts. But if the only way for there to be a, a category, um, if the only way to add a category is if there's some kind of history, can you? Is there are there any new categories left to be found? If you, you see what my question is, right? Are there any new categories we found if there has to be history to make one? I suppose there would not be any categories left unless mm, they change the meaning of um, a word that they're trying to describe. Do you see how Roberts' test is circular, right? How is this test circular? Because it's not... Um, it's not so narrowly tailored. No, 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 so no, no, no. It just opens. No, no, no. no. Just stop, 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 stop. How is Roberts's test circular? Is it ever going to be possible with Roberts's test to recognize a new category of unprotected speech? Will it ever be possible? No. Why not? Because you can't change history. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, Jack. Exactly right. You can't change history. This is why Roberts drives me insane. I mean, I, I think he probably reaches the right result but he creates a test that's impossible to satisfy. He says, we will only add a new category of unprotected speech if there's a long history of that category being in existence. But if there was a history of that category being in existence, the court would have already recognized it, right? How can the court recognize something new that's not recognized before? The court can only recognize what's recognized in the past. Robert is saying is no mas. We have these four or five categories, obscenity, defamation, fraud, incitement. That's it. We're done. Pack it up, folks. How many of you saw that when Robert said that? Did anybody notice that? He drives me insane. He's so crafty. He's like a fox, right? 
And just like he does this, he's like, oh, look at me. I'm John Roberts. And like he just makes a test that can't be satisfied. Uh, but anyone would, you know, who reads it carefully recognize what he's doing. Okay. So that's the first part of the Roberts opinion. See, it's not just Obamacare. He does this everywhere, right? He's always making stuff up and trying to trick people. He's very, he's like Loki or some sort of trickster. He's always, you know, just pretending stuff. Um, all right. Next. So Roberts will not go along with creating a new category of unprotected speech, which I think is probably right. This entire, what's called the categorical approach, where if you fit in a certain category, you're outside the scope of the First Amendment. I think that approach was just made up. But So again, I, I, I agree with Roberts where he goes, but just his analysis drives me nuts. All right. Next, the government wants some sort of a balancing test, right? And, you know, first-year law students are taught to love balancing tests. I hate them. They're, they're just meaningless, right? Because how do you balance them? What, how much weight do you put on each side? It's just it's, it's arbitrary. But here is the test the government wants. The government says um, you have to have a categorical balancing of the value of the speech against its societal costs. The balancing of the value of the speech against its societal costs. Uh, Amanda, you here? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, Mandy, I'm sorry. Mandy, how should a court go about applying that test that you have to balance the the value of the speech against the societal cost? How how's the court supposed to do that? Um, well, it says that that test is actually a very dangerous test to use. It said that the First Amendment guarantee of free speech does not extend only to categories of speech that survive the balancing test. Why is it, why is it, I think, okay, so you're giving me a good answer. Why is, why does Robert say that this sort of balancing is dangerous? I think dangerous is a good word, but, but tell me why, please. Hmm. This was actually the question Grant answered about a couple minutes ago. So he was go going at, he's just a little bit ahead of the game. Um, was it because of the overbreadth? Like Ooh, no, now, now you're going five minutes ahead even further. I'm not not an overbreath yet. <laughs> See, you guys are you guys are, look. I'll tell you, it's good when students answer my question five minutes down the road. But I got I got to get there. I've got to build up to it. So just in the it, it, just Mandy, just for just in the abstract, right? Why are balancing tests so dangerous in the context of free speech? Just in general, forget forget this case. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's not like. I don't know. It's not very clear cut. It's or like black and white. It's kind of there's no right or wrong answer. I don't know how. Okay, I, th I think we're we're getting closer, right? <laughs> um, thank you, Mandy. So Robert says, <clears throat> in the context of the First Amendment, balancing's different because it's what we call ad hoc, where you basically make it up as you go along. There's no way to have any sort of neutral principle to decide what's a societal cost and what's a value of speech. It's a very subjective value, right? How is a judge supposed to decide how much speech is needed, right? Um, how dangerous is speech? Uh, Roberts writes without any authority, but I think he's right. Um, the First Amendment reflects a judgment. This is Grant's point. The First Amendment reflects a judgment by the American people that the benefits of its restrictions on the government outweigh the cost. In other words, the framers in 1791 balanced the First Amendment for us, right? They decided that the speech is worth more than the cost. Did they? Who the hell knows? Roberts has no authority for that proposition. He just sort of made it up. But I like it. It's good, right? He just he just says stuff. And he's like, I'm the chief. It's good to be the chief. Like, you know, Mel Brooks in History of the World. It's good to be the king. Um, our Constitution forecloses any attempt to revise that judgment simply on the basis that some speech is not worth it. So what Roberts is saying is we really don't care about the social cost of the speech. We don't care about the harmful effects. He doesn't actually mean that in any way because you'll see otherwise he doesn't actually mean that. But he says it here. Right? But what about other cases where they use balancing tests? Well, he mentions Chaplinsky, which is a fighting words case. Um, and he basically says, yeah, don't worry about Chaplinsky. Right? Remember I told you it's probably not good law? This is what this is what I had in mind, right? The court base says, yeah, 
just just don't look at Chaplinsky. You know, it's kind of like a magician with a sleight of hand. You know, there, there, there is no spoon. There is no Chaplinsky. It's not there. Um, so he just sort of brushes that away. Uh, what about Ferber? Right? Ferber was a case about child pornography, in which case there is balancing. Um, what Robert says there is that the that basically child pornography is unique because when child pornography is being made, a child is being abused, and we have to use a different test. Um, Justice Alito responds, well, animals are being destroyed when these, when these videos are being made. I mean, obviously, children are more important than animals. I think most people agree with that. If you don't, just keep it yourselves. Um, but animals are important too, right? We have bans and animal cruelty. Uh, Roberts has no response in this point, I don't think. Maybe, maybe you do, but I think Roberts, I think Alito has the better of Roberts. Um, I think Roberts just distinguishes away Chaplinsky and Ferber because he doesn't like them. And he really thinks in the free speech context, there should be no balancing. Um, you might call it strict scrutiny, but it's basically the government loses, right? Heads I win, tails you lose. Once you're in this category of, of, uh, uh, of restriction on the basis of content and you're not one of these traditional categories, the government's going to lose. The government's not going to win. All right. Question so far. Now I want to get to overbreath, which I think Manny brought up. Oh, Manny, do you want to do you want to just tell us about overbreath? You, you brought up. I want to make sure you get a chance to give an answer on that because it was very good what you said. Sure. Um, so the overbreath doctrine is essentially they said if a substantial number of applications are unconstitutional, like of the law, then it's considered like highly overbreath. Overbroad. Or overbroad. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Mandy. Uh -huh. So this is doctrine in law called overbreath. Um, we studied it with RAV versus St. Paul, which was the cross-burning case from Minnesota. And it goes like this. Let's say that Mr. Stevens um, engaged in a crush film, right? Which was illegal to, to film because you can't abuse animals. Let's say he can be prosecuted under the statute, but then someone else sells a video of bullfighting and bullfighting is legal in Spain, but it's illegal in, you know, Texas. It would probably be unconstitutional to punish the bullfighting person. Let's say someone makes a hunting video. You probably couldn't prosecute the person for the hunting video because it's instructional. Mr. Stevens, in his defense, can raise other hypothetical prosecutions and say, look, this statute will be unconstitutional for bullfighting. This statute will be unconstitutional for hunting videos. This is an overbroad statute. And because the statute will be unconstitutional as applied to other people, you can't enforce it against me. Whoa. Right? How the heck do you do that? Um, this is a weird doctrine, which I think may be on its way out. Uh, Justice Thomas has suggested it's, it's unconstitutional, that you can't have a defendant in one case assert the free speech rights of random hypothetical other cases. It's never made much sense, to be frank. Um, usually we talk about Article Three standing, right? You, you only go to court if you have an injury. Right, you're being prosecuted for a specific offense. You had dog fighting videos. How the hell can you assert the rights of people who make bullfighting videos or hunting videos? What what did, what did they have to do with your case? Why can't your prosecution go forward? So at least under the overbreath doctrine, which Robert seems to accept here, um, the court says we're not going to allow this to happen, right? Because there might be some other valid uses some, some other valid videos that would be prosecuted here mr stevens can't be prosecuted so in the end they vacate stevens's conviction and they declare the statute unconstitutional because it's too overbroad it's again it's it's a well-written opinion but there's a lot going on robert says we can't have this we we won't add a new category speech we're not gonna do this ad hoc balancing um oh and by the way overbreath Right, he sort of just throws it all together. It's a very, it's a very weird opinion. I, 
it, it I, I, I have trouble teaching it. It's just, it's a weird case the way Roberts wrote it. He's usually much more direct. I think here he took this kind of serpentine path. Woman, a fox, woman, a snake, all the words I'm using for Roberts, but took a very indirect path. Yes, Macy, I see your hands up. Yeah. So when you were talking about the overbreath doctrine and how, like, um, it could possibly be unconstitutional. If that were the case and this idea was unconstitutional and you couldn't use it as a reasoning for declaring a statute unconstitutional, how would somebody do that? Would they have to like join their claim with other people's claims saying well, together? Well, well, keep in mind, this is a criminal statute. And usually the way people challenge criminal statutes is they're being charged with a crime and they have to raise a defense, right? Um, you could also bring a facial challenge. Let's say that you're in the business of making hunting videos and you would say, I am seeking a declaration of the statute unconstitutional as applied to my type of speech. The overbreath doctrine makes things a lot easier because if, if one person brings the case, that person can basically raise arguments back to the entire United States of America, every possible video. Again, it's just it's not that it's unconstitutional precisely. It's that the federal court have limited jurisdiction and you can't assert someone else's rights in a case, right? You can't assert the hypothetical speech of some bullfighting instructor, right? You can only assert your own, your own case. I, I admit I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument. I, I don't know how this doctrine, I mean, how it, I know it began, but just it, 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 it was never explained well how it was justified. But at least here, eight justices signed on to it. I don't think Thomas would anymore. Thomas has signaled he's off. And, and you know, usually when Justice Thomas says something, four or five years later, the court catches up. He's, he's you know, you think Scalia's in charge. It was actually Thomas in charge. He was pulling everyone, and he's he still does it. That's why you have to read a Thomas dissent very carefully, because he usually says things, and a couple years later, it happens. All right. Other questions in the Roberts majority opinion? All right. Uh, we have the Justice Alito dissent. Um, and, and, and Justice Alito, again, is a it's basically a traditional conservative. He, he doesn't like courts getting in the business of interfering with uh, 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 state uh, morality laws. Uh, this is something that he's perfectly content with. Um, now, Alito makes, a, I think, a fair point, right? Let's just assume for argument's sake that a bullfighting video will be protected and a hunting video is protected. No one actually says that a dog fighting video would be protected, right? No one actually says that a crush film is protected. So Alito says, why can't we read the statute with, I don't know, dare we call the saving construction, right? We, we narrow the statute. We say the statute is only constitutional as applied to certain types of uh, animal cruelty. We know the chief was willing to do that in the Obamacare case, right? Narrow a statute to save its constitutionality. But Robert says, no, in the context of the First Amendment, we will not narrow the statute. We will not trust the government to bring only specific charges. Congress has to start from scratch where they wipe the entire statute off the map. Think about that for a second, right? The court could have said, we will read the statute narrowly to only apply to certain types of crush films, which are obscene and fall into the obscenity test. This was, I think, Haley's question some time ago. But the court says, we're not gonna narrow statutes. We're not gonna give the prosecutors discretion. If Congress wants to enact this law, they can start from scratch. And indeed they did. After, <clears throat> after this case was enacted, Congress enacted a, another law which effectively banned only crush films, right? There was an act pact, I think it was actually in 2010, might have been the same year, which banned crush films. And that's actually been upheld by the lower courts. Why? Because it's within the definition of obscenity, right? It's prurient interest, it's disgusting, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it lacks any serious literary value, but this new statute is more narrowly tailored. So basically the court said, this statute is too broad, try again. And they enacted another statute. Now, I don't think Mr. Stevens was ever re-prosecuted because I don't think he would his conduct fit under the new statute. So, you know, he got off, I don't, I don't want to say free, but, but his conviction was wiped out. Okay. Questions? Chris, so go ahead. Yeah, so do you happen to know 
who paid for him to take this all the way to the Supreme Court? Like, what group supported his argument? Um, I see represented him. I don't remember. Just give me a second. I'll take me 20 seconds to find it. Um, the, the short answer, I'll tell you who it was in a second, is that lawyers take cases to the Supreme Court pro bono. Oh, she had, had a very good lawyer, Patty Millett. Um, she's currently on the D.C. Circuit. Um, so lawyers will take cases to the Supreme Court pro bono basically to build a practice, right? It's considered a very good um, marketing tool if you have a lot of Supreme Court arguments under your belt. So the most um, distinguished appellate lawyers will be willing to work for free for any Supreme Court case. And this happens in one of two ways. One, uh, appellate lawyers will often search the lower courts for cases they think will be good vehicles. So I'm sure Patty Millett, who was at a, one of the top firms in DC, uh, saw this case in the Court of Appeals and said, aha, there was an en banc decision, I think with three dissents, I want this case. And they basically have, it, I'm, I'm not joking, it's called a beauty pageant, where different law firms pitch the client on why they're the right firm to take the case. So law firms basically chase after these golden nuggets. Um, the second way they get the case is after the court grants review, everyone converges and hire me, hire me, hire me. So even if the person had a very good lawyer in the court of appeals, the Supreme Court practitioners show up. It's like, oh, that's nice. He's he's in the sandbox. Come play with the big boys now, right? And they basically poach the client. Um, it's borderline eth unethical. I, I just you guys think we'll take PR to to try and steal a client from his lawyer. Um, I, I qualms, but that's how it works. These are very valuable cases. The court has what seventy or eighty arguments a year. And Patty Millett had, I think, had like 20 or 30 arguments here. You can just see her, her argument. She's very good. She's on the D.C. circuit now. She's also a lovely person, uh, very nice. So, uh, you know, she, she doesn't defend the dogfighter because she likes dogfighting. She does it because it's a good case for the First Amendment. Yeah, but she argued, I think, probably 20 or 30 cases. She's, she's quite good. All right. Questions? All right, so today we did Stevens, right? And this was a test where the court was not willing to recognize new categories of unprotected speech. They weren't willing to apply ad hoc balancing tests. Um, in our next case, uh, which we'll study on, I guess, on Wednesday, we do video game violence. And where the goal is specifically the protection of children. So this Ferber case we, we keep talking about will come back over and over again. Uh, what's to protect the children? I have the minute poll running. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah, if you are letter C, D, or E, please don't be absent on Wednesday. I'll know. If, if I do that, I'll start taking countermeasures. Uh, but C, D, and E are up on Wednesday. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful, uh, I'll be in office hours in about 25 minutes. And I uh, hope to talk to you all soon. Thank you.